Before the video begins, I wanted to let you know that the victim in this case, Puya Poladian, was a friend of mine. I'll go into the friendship that I had with him near the end of the video, but as always, to start, time to dive into the details of the case. In 2018, 24-year-old Puya Poladian was working three jobs to support his family and put himself through aviation school. His father had died six years earlier due to a heart attack, and seeing as the family moved to Australia from Iran, they had a very small support network. Following his father's death, Puya would take over as the sole provider for the household, and his income helped sustain his mother and his 20-year-old sister who was going to university. A year earlier, in 2017, Puya had started to look into options to resolve sleep apnea, as it was affecting his sleep and making things increasingly more difficult in his day-to-day -day life. He learns of a surgeon called Dr. William Mooney, a man who claims on his website to be Australia's leading ear, nose and throat specialist. And for one year, Puya attempts conservative medical treatment to resolve his issues. These treatments don't work, and in February of 2018, he visits Dr. Mooney again to discuss surgical options. Dr. William Mooney had made quite a name for himself in the Australian medical world. First registering as a practitioner in December of 1990, he would complete a number of fellowships that would see him eventually open his own practice in the elusive location of Bondi Beach, a well-known spot where celebrities would live and congregate. He states that approximately he was performing 300 rhinoplasty procedures a year, 100 functional endoscopic sinus surgeries, and 40 other minor surgeries, such as tonsil removals. In the years following the opening of his practice, he would often go on talk shows to discuss his work. I'm Dr. William Mooney. I'm a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. I super specialize in facial cosmetic surgery and head and neck cancer procedures. I'm on staff at Prince Wales Hospital as a head and neck cancer surgeon. This means I've performed really complicated procedures, life and death procedures with multiple surgeons that take all day to perform. When you've got this background to your surgical technique, you're scared of nothing, you're prepared for anything. And I think you need a specialist with that depth of experience, that confidence. I perform over 300 rhinoplasties a year, and I've been doing that for over a decade. I've seen just about any nose you can come up with. I've seen post-trauma cases, difficult revision cases, disastrous noses that have been involved with malignancy or terrible functional problems. And I've seen my fair share of pretty straightforward, simple rhinoplasty as well. Now, Monica has recently had her procedure and she's here with her surgeon, Dr. William Mooney, to tell us all about it. Morning. Morning. Morning, Morning Monica. Now, a lot of people, including celebrities, have rhinoplasty. What are the most common reasons for it? It's different to a lot of other cosmetic procedures. It's always a combination of function and cosmesis. Even if it's a slight breathing problem, there's always a combination of two things. Monica's exactly the same. She really presented with a combination of both those problems. Look, you've got to have it clear in your head why you're getting this procedure from the get-go, you know. Um, number two, do your research on the procedure and on the guy who's going to perform it. And finally, have realistic outcome expectations. You know, know what we can achieve with this and make sure you're getting it for the right reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you look at David and I and sort of go, oh, I could just fix that he's if already I told just I, take look, a look? I, look, I've already told David I'm, I'm good but I'm not a magician. But he's <laughs> 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 It's true. It's funny because it's so, true. I love a comic surgeon. <laughs> so, uh, ageing gracefully versus ageing disgracefully. You know, I'm, I never stop being amazed considering what we stick in ourselves, expose ourselves to, how we treat our bodies. Humans look pretty good for a lot of their adult life. Look age appropriate, don't overfill, don't over paralyse mm. and get happy because happiness is the be better than any other drug we can you supply. You always say happiness, don't you, Dr. Moore? Do. Thanks for joining us, buddy. Yeah, Up next. After consulting with Puya regarding his ongoing sleep apnea problem, Dr. Mooney would recommend surgery. The operation was quite expensive and Puya would release a GoFundMe page where he says, I have been struggling to sleep and breathe properly for many years now. Apparently, I have a severe case of sleep apnea, and it's caused by my sinuses and the nasal passages not being straight. I have been to many specialists, and they have all recommended me to do a surgery, which will cost me about six to $7,000, even with my private health insurance. I am a student pilot and work two full-time and a part-time jobs to just support my family and myself through school and pay the debt I have. 
And despite really needing this surgery, I haven't been able to do it for many years because I can't afford it. Then my friend told me about this GoFundMe idea, and this is my first time trying this. Any contribution would really help me get better and support my family too. Puya manages to raise the money, and on February 15th, 2018, he meets with Dr. Mooney to have the surgery done. The surgery is completed, and two days later, Puya is released from the hospital. That very night, after eating some food, he begins to vomit blood, and blood is also leaking from his nose. Emergency services are contacted, and he's rushed to hospital. Whilst in emergency, Puya suffers a cardiac arrest. CPR is performed on him for 45 minutes, but he doesn't wake up. On March 2nd, he's pronounced brain dead, and he passes away shortly after. His family is distraught, and struggles to come to grips with the loss of their son and brother. His sister posts on Facebook, Due to unforeseen events post-operation, my 24-year-old brother, Puya Palladian, passed away a few days ago. He was an amazing and hard-working person who never failed to care deeply for my mother and I. He was truly our inspiration in life. Words cannot describe what an angel he was. Rest easy, Captain Puya. Dr. Mooney speaks about the surgery, and his public response is that although the death of Puya is a tragedy, it was not due to the procedure. News stations begin to pick up the story and dig a little deeper into Dr. Mooney. It is soon learned that a year earlier, in 2017, the surgeon had some restrictions placed upon him due to allegations of cocaine use, and there was a surgery performed on another man where things did not go to plan. The details of this surgery show that 41-year-old Alex Twill, also known as Little Al, was a debt collector, and at some point in his life, a figure in one of Australia's bikey gangs. At the time of the surgery, he was expecting his fourth child with his wife. Alex had gone to Dr. Mooney due to nasal discharge and had been for a few years. In 2017, he was going to undergo a complicated surgery. During the operation, Dr. Mooney had pierced the patient's brain with his utensil, which resulted in Alex being put on life support for five days until the decision was made to turn his machines off. When news of all of this comes to light, Dr. Mooney pays around $40,000 to a search engine optimization company to ensure that the negative stories coming up about him are suppressed. He also launches a defamation case against the news station, which is unsuccessful. March of 2018, the medical tribunal launches an investigation into Dr. Mooney, and many troubling details are uncovered. The first of which, as I mentioned earlier, in 2017, Dr. Mooney had conditions placed on his practicing certificate due to the allegations of cocaine use, and he had to undergo weekly drug testing. Although these restrictions were lifted in 2018, at the time of seeing Puya, he had not disclosed this information to any of his patients, as it's not against the law to do so, and it was up to the patients to find out about such restrictions through their own research. In regards to Puya's surgery, the details are lengthy, and I'll summarise them down to what I believe to be the most relevant. The surgery begun at 3.05pm, and during it, a nurse recalls hearing Dr. Mooney say that the patient's tonsils were adhered like cement. He was having trouble cutting through them. Blood had begun to spurt, and the doctor says that it was an arterial bleed. He gains control over the bleeding, and then sews it closed. The nurse noticed that he had attempted to sew it closed twice unsuccessfully before managing to gain control of the situation. He continues to observe the bleed site for several minutes afterwards, and had even checked for a facial pulse, showing that he was concerned about what had occurred. The surgery ends, and the nurse reports that the entire procedure took 23 minutes. The time it took for this operation was something that the tribunal found to be astonishingly short. They would state that the most experienced, expert, and efficient surgical hands, without having to deal with arterial bleeding, would have expected the operation to take at least 70 minutes, in most cases 90. When the surgery ends and Puya wakes up, nurses told his family that Dr. Mooney would come see them, and so they waited for five hours until 8pm. When they ask where the doctor is, 
They're informed that he had gone home. They were never spoken to and never informed of the complications that had occurred with the surgery. Over the next two days, whilst Puya was recovering in the hospital, the family did not see Dr. Mooney at all and were only able to speak with his staff. When Puya had begun vomiting blood and eventually fainted, the family tried to contact emergency phone numbers provided by Dr. Mooney, but no one answered. Thus why emergency services were called, and he was rushed to the hospital again. It's at this point, while he's in hospital, that the family learned of the artery that was damaged during surgery. They were informed by another doctor, who Mooney told about the complications. Mooney visits the family in hospital, and he tells them that he had done six surgeries that same day, and all of them were fine. When they raised the concern about the nicked artery, Dr. Mooney suggested it was nothing, and that barely any blood was lost. Furthermore, he portrays the entire incident as a freak accident. Overall, due to what I've discussed here, and many many other details, the tribunal finds his work to be inadequate and below standard conduct. The other surgery that is scrutinized is the one where Alex passed away, a few months before Puya. A range of problems that go into great detail are once again discovered, and I'll summarize down the most interesting. The surgery was found to have been performed too soon after another one. They say there was not enough time for the swelling to subside between operations. Dr. Mooney's notes prior to the surgery taking place indicate that he believed the procedure was going to be a short one, but this is said to be inappropriate due to the many complexities of it. The patient had previous surgeries in conjunction with a delicate structure in the nasal passage which was going to be altered. It is said by a peer of the doctors that Mooney's view of the surgery going to be short indicates that he does not have the insight, experience, or knowledge which is expected of him to perform a surgery such as this. During the procedure, 20 minutes in, the patient is noted to have made spontaneous ventilator efforts, and his body moved erratically, his blood pressure skyrockets, and Dr. Mooney is on record saying that this is the highest blood pressure reading he's ever seen, and he doesn't know why. The surgery completes, and Mooney begins operating on another patient, whilst Alex is transferred to the recovery ward. Whilst Dr. Mooney is operating on the next patient, a nurse enters the theatre and says, That guy's not right. Referring to Alex, Dr. Mooney goes to check on him, and when he does, Alex is not conscious and making erratic movements, his eyes deviating. CT scans are performed on the man, and to summarize down some extensive medical terminology, there was significant damage to the man's brain, which was not caused by disease or any natural happenings. The coroner concludes that an instrument during surgery caused the damage, which ultimately killed Alex. The tribunal comes to the conclusion that this surgery was performed far too quickly. The operation had to be done with a significant degree of care and absolute attention to detail, as the case was fraught with hazard, and it could not have been performed with that level of care in around 25 minutes. It is further found that during the surgery, Dr. Mooney never consulted CT scans of the patient. Other doctors advise that a surgery as complicated as this one CT scans should be reviewed multiple times throughout it. Dr. Mooney would say regarding this operation, the sentinel event, I believe, was that once Alex had moved, I did not take sufficient time to reorientate myself properly. I should have thoroughly rechecked my landmarks, reviewed the CT scans, proceeded more slowly and with greater caution, or perhaps not have continued the surgery. I did none of those things. Regrettably, I proceeded to use sharp and dangerous instrumentation at the base of the skull in a high-risk position. There are many more details regarding this investigation into Mooney's conduct, but I won't dive too deep into them. Essentially, it is learned that he had an inappropriate relationship with a 22-year-old patient for a number of years. Throughout this, he prescribed her medications in excessive quantities without appropriate therapeutic purposes, without appropriate monitoring, and without appropriate advice. He also exchanged thousands of text messages, hundreds of phone calls, and had at least one possible sexual liaison with her. As it so often happens, 
Once word got out that he was under investigation, the floodgates would open and there would be many other people come forward to share their stories about Dr. Mooney and his misconduct. There's a makeup artist who says he ruined her life with his poor work on her nose. Another patient who continually vomited blood following their operation with him. And another who claims he woke up mid-surgery. The list goes on and on. As a precautionary measure of the investigation taking place, restrictions are placed upon the doctor, limiting the drugs he can prescribe and the surgeries he can perform. He also must submit to drug testing, where his hair would be analysed for possible traces of cocaine. Dr. Mooney says that he becomes concerned due to handling cocaine whilst performing surgeries, and he's worried that he may test positive. Initially, he doesn't attend these drug tests, and has a range of reasons for why that is. At one point, he even presents doctor certificates to show that he was sick, but it is learned that on these very days where he claimed to be sick, he was in fact in surgery, operating on patients. When he did turn up for the drug test, almost a fortnight late, he had a buzz cut, and not enough hair was present to gain an accurate reading. Despite this, his hair tested positive for a small amount of cocaine on five separate occasions. Experts are unable to determine conclusively as to whether it had been due to work exposure or illicit drug use. It's not until April of 2022, when the investigation is complete, that Dr. Mooney's license to practice is suspended for a year. The doctor is allowed to reapply for a practicing certificate when that concludes. The New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal would say, it is highly unlikely that William Mooney, an ear, nose and throat surgeon, will repeat any of the mistakes of the past. In our view, Mr. Mooney has proven that he can be trusted to practice in an honest and ethical manner and presents no risk to the safety of the public and their confidence in the profession. Six months after this suspension, he is arrested for illegally buying recreational cocaine outside of his Bondi apartment. When the matter went to court, he claimed that he was collecting the cocaine for his partner, as he didn't want her interacting with strangers at night. The magistrate is told during the trial that he's not a drug user and has been undergoing drug screening for almost six years now. His urine samples always returned negative results. What is withheld from the court though, are those five occasions where his hair samples returned potential positive results for recreational cocaine use. While he escaped a conviction for this, the magistrate unleashed on the surgeon for his behavior, telling him, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. But due to the pro bono work Mooney had been doing for Indigenous Australians over the past 20 years, she says, I'm going to give you a chance to get on with the very good work that you do. A conviction is not passed down, and he's put on a 12-month good behaviour bond. At the point of making this video, March of 2024, it seems as though his licence is still not active yet. After Puya passed away, his mother and sister were known by friends to be suffering intensely. Six months following his death, they are both found deceased in their car in the backyard of their house. The property was in pristine condition, and everything was clean and tidy. Their German shepherd was also located, deceased in the car. On the door of the house, there was a handwritten note, and it reads, Dear neighbours, please call the police. We are in our car in the backyard. Thank you. Love you. It's at this point of the video that I've moved away from presenting research, and now speak from my own thoughts and opinions. As mentioned at the very start of this video, Puya was a friend of mine. A good friend. I've actually thought about making this video many times over the last few years, and I tossed back and forth whether I should. Ultimately, I landed on doing it, not because I knew him, but because I do think it's an important story to get out there. Since Puya's death, I've thought about him and his family frequently. What started as trying to understand what happened, soon opened up into the shock at how Dr. Mooney handled himself throughout all of this. I understand that surgeons are human beings as well. They have lives, they have stresses, and they make mistakes. But when people are putting their lives in your hands, literally, 
Another level of professional care and attention to detail is required. Maybe it's my emotion bringing up these thoughts. But the doctor killed two men. Obviously, I don't believe he did it on purpose. But either way, two men are dead due to a direct cause of his work. Work that was proven to be inadequate, inappropriate, and below standard. If this were another scenario, and someone accidentally killed someone else but didn't mean to, wouldn't there be charges such as manslaughter, or even grievous bodily harm due to negligence? Years in prison would be faced. Fines must be paid. Yet, it seems this doctor got away with a one-year temporary suspension of his work, and probably a sentence consisting of a boatload of stress with a heavy dose of anxiety. It boggles my mind how this could occur. If anyone who has a deeper understanding of the legal workings behind such a matter has any insight into this, the laws in place to protect doctors under these circumstances, please do let me know. I'd love to learn how one can get away with such a slap on the wrist. Despite all of that though, I was expecting to learn the things I did about him based on rumours I'd heard from people in my life talking about his potential cocaine use. But what I wasn't expecting to learn was the utter failure of the regulator to efficiently handle this situation so that other patients are not at risk. Why wasn't Dr. Mooney properly investigated after the first death? And furthermore, why has he received such a minor punishment, a year suspension, in the face of such overwhelming evidence, where he time after time lied to the board about his conduct, his relationship with patients, false medical certificates, allegations of drug use. I uncovered countless articles where people are calling for the regulator to be reviewed, not only in relation to this case, but many others. They have been criticized for a slow and cumbersome investigation process and the sheer lack of communication with the public as to what's going on. They suffer from a lack of oversight and a significant lack of accountability. There are claims that regulators have misled parliament and the public and they have a focus on blaming individuals, rather than looking at systematic failure. In 2022, 129,000 complaints were received against medical practitioners, and of these, only 30 resulted in cancellations or suspensions of the practice's license. Doctors and patients alike over the last few years have come forward to speak about their view of the regulator's review process saying that it's very slow and nobody understands what's involved. It's opaque and convoluted. The general consensus is that the reasons for their failures are that the body is under-resourced. There's bullying and a toxic culture. It's rife with systematic racism and an inability to effectively communicate with all parties involved in an investigation. There is a growing fear that the regulator is failing to protect the public. I believe that a body like this is essential to the medical field, and when they are falling short for whatever reason that may be, then change needs to happen, because it's the public who are at risk. And here with Puya and Alex, we have an example of what that looks like. Should the regulator have taken action earlier, patients such as Puya wouldn't have had the misfortune of going under the knife by a surgeon who is inadequate. Heck. Even if doctors were forced to disclose restrictions that were placed upon them, if they had to inform the public of any relevant complications they've had in the past, if Puya and his family had known that a patient had passed away as a direct result of the surgery performed on him only months earlier, they may have opted to find someone else. Moving my attention to the victims, I'll focus in on Puya because I knew the man, and what an absolute legend of a human being he was. His positivity was endless. I was about two years older than him when we worked together repairing computers at a tech company. I'd get into work in the mornings, or the afternoons, check the roster to see who I was on shift with, and if I saw Puya's name, I knew it was going to be a good day. We would laugh and joke constantly, much to the annoyance of our superiors. But also, the man was a rock, a pillar, it didn't matter what mood I was in, he was there to meet me and engage with it, and it seems from conversations with others that this wasn't exclusive to the friendship he and I shared. Everyone I know has nothing but good things to say about Puya and his family. 
Whilst making this video, and looking at the pictures of him, it's truly hard to believe he's not here with us anymore. He was larger than life. If I tried my best, I really couldn't fault him in any way. He was as straight edge as they come, family focused, and motivated to succeed beyond belief. This guy would hit the gym harder than anyone else I knew, and he would do it at times after working 16 hours straight at a number of jobs. Then he would get up the next day and do it all again. This tragedy shook so many people, and his family were hit the hardest. They relied on him in so many ways. Some may argue that this is unhealthy, that the burden of a family shouldn't be placed on the shoulders of one son. But he didn't feel that way. He took it on with a smile and tackled each and every day as they came. I remember the day I learned of the passing of his mother and sister. The shock still lingers, and from everyone who I've spoken with, these two women were equally as special as their brother and son. Good people who are faced with grief that could not be overcome. Whatever Dr. Mooney's reasons may be for the botched surgery, when Puya went under his knife, the doctor held the lives of an entire family in his hands, and it really doesn't seem like the gravity of that has ever been something that he's acknowledged, at least publicly. I'm not one to put much thought into what happens after death, but I think about it a lot in relation to this tragedy, and have done so many times over the years. These were good people, and now they're just gone. I'm certain everyone watching this has experienced the loss of someone they love, in some way, shape, or form. The question that comes up time after time again, how could this happen? It'll never be answered. Life is like that, right? It can be beautiful, and it can be horrendous. We all engage with the world in a way that sees us placed in danger on a daily basis. Maybe it's not going in for a surgery. It could be as simple as standing on the sidewalk of a busy road whilst waiting for the lights to change. Heck, even eating food that's prepared by people whom we'll likely never meet. At any point, it can go south, and then that's it. That was our time here. At so many points in our lives, we're just a moment away from chaos. Chaos that is so often controlled by people we don't know. It would be an understatement to say that the tragedy that befell this family rocked me and so many others to our core. And if there is life after death, I really hope that Puya and his family are together with each other.